So if you don't know me, my name is Jennifer Jerome. I'm one of the pediatric hospitalists, and I was one of the ones who um, helped roll out our pilot project on neonatal abstinence syndrome and eat sleep console uh, over on pediatrics. And I'm here because it's going to be going live in FMC and NICU um, starting November 10th. It's actually going live system-wide um, at that point with an epic upgrade too. So um, I know you all know a lot about it already, but I uh, just kind of wanted to go through the protocol and the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so we're going to talk about the background state for NAS, our, um, how we developed our pilot project for uh, non-pharmacologic cares and Eat Sleep Console, and go through the results that we've had on pediatrics so far. Uh, so you probably know we have over, probably over 200 babies who are opiate exposed um, every year. So Homish County has a really high rate of 56 per 1,000 newborns who are intrauterine and opiate exposed. And the numbers are, of course, increasing. And up until last year, um, in 2018, we had the you know, Finnegan and the long morphine protocol like everyone else. Um, you all know the, the Finnegan scoring. It's time intensive, it's complicated, it's not as objective as, as it should be. And so our pediatric hospitals team had some questions about why are we treating benign symptoms with morphine? Um, the system is variable and time intensive between users. And so we wanted to then, but also why are we scheduling morphine automatically for certain arbitrary scores? And then having this really long, at least a minimum of around 12 day length of stay. So why use morphine to treat benign symptoms? Why automatically start morphine? And uh, when it comes to a unit like ours where we can't give morphine, why do we have to separate these babies from their mothers um, in a high stimulus NICU? So uh, our protocol was based on these two and other studies that were really revolutionary that came out over the last couple of years. So the Allison Holmes Dartmouth study um, talked about what we already know, that rooming in is best for these babies and not separating them from their mothers. Uh, and then Dr. Grossman's study out of Yale in 2017 really developed the sleep console uh, protocol and getting rid of Finnegan's and it's just really taken off nationally because um, starting with these. So in pediatrics, we started in our official protocol in February of 2018, but really before that, we were all, you all know, we were already moving babies over to peds when their moms were discharged um, to keep them together rather than keeping them in NICU. So we've been doing rooming in really for a long time. Um, we have the three main interventions that are now gonna happen here too. So the biggest one is increasing non-pharmacologic cares, which is also the biggest burden on the families and the staff. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, getting rid of Finnegan's and implementing Eat Sleep Console, and then changing the way we use morphine as well. So I'll go to these original, um, this is our, this is going to be hard to see, but our key driver diagram with the three main interventions and all of the secondary drivers that helped to do that to try to decrease morphine usage. Um, so started bringing in um, on FMC with mom as much as possible and transferring to pediatrics. So we're going to continue doing that whenever moms are dischargeable. Um, they can go over to pediatrics for the rest of the baby's stay and only in NICU if they have other reasons like prematurity or needing IV fluid or something like that. Um, so really emphasizing the family's primary role. So a lot of parents, I think, get, um, they don't want to see any withdrawal symptoms, some subset of parents, um, and they, you know, they, want, they know what it feels like to go through withdrawal themselves. So a lot of them really want morphine for their babies, but trying to frame this as you are treatment for your babies um, and uh, the non-pharmacologic cares that you're doing are really the best medicine, better than morphine. Um, frequent feedings on demand, you all know this, um, not to make them wait until the three hour mark to feed, breastfeeding when appropriate, frequent skin to skin, um, skin care with diaper changes, and you all know these things too about swaddling, holding, rocking, uh, minimizing noises and lights, and minimizing overdressing so they don't get overheated. Um, we're expanding our cuddler program. Hopefully you'll be able to take advantage of cuddlers here too if needed, if the family is exhausted or not able to safely take care of their baby. Rockers, have, this is one instance where um, pacifiers should just be free to use for everybody and not um, regulated when the baby's going to be nasty. Okay, um, so now I'll kind of go through the nuts and bolts of our protocol. So the basics are eat, is baby able to eat at age appropriate volume? Sleep, can baby sleep at least one hour? And console, can they be consoled within 10 minutes? So those are the basic guidelines. Um, we have nursing templates now for documenting scores, and it's actually gonna be built into Epic. Um, Finnegan's are gonna be gone, and the ESC template will be in Epic. 
and we have physician notes now tailored to them too. Um, so it, the most, one of the most important things is making sure that the symptom is due to NAS and not something else like prematurity or the first 24 hours of life when they are waking frequently and it can be normal that they're feeding you know, more often than every hour, not sleeping an hour or so. Um, so we really should only score them negatively uh, or have them lose a point if the symptom is definitely due to NAS. So if it's, um, you're doing the 35 week protocol at the same time here, if it's a 35 weeker who seems to be um, feeding poorly because they're extra sleepy, then that is probably not NAS related. But if it's a term baby who you know, is chompy at the breast, is frantic, cannot focus, cannot um, sustain a feeding, um, then that's when you would score them poorly for feeding. And um, optimizing all pharmacologic care, we're gonna get rid of the finnegans entirely, and um, we don't wait for the infant for scoring, just score whenever they're up and, and feeding. So now I'll go through these individually in a little bit more detail. So the eating, like I said, unable to coordinate feeding within 10 minutes of showing cues, or unable to sustain a feeding at the breast, or doesn't have to be 10 milliliters, but an age appropriate um, amount by bottle or figure feeding or SNS. Um, so usually due, due to tremors, uh, fussiness, uncoordinated suck, not just a sleepy preemie baby or a sleepy baby in the first 24 hours of life. Okay, um, next one. And so optimal feeding, baby should initiate the feeding with early cues and feed until con content, um, a deep and comfortable latch at the breast or, or an effective suck and swallow um, with bottle feeding. So sleeping, they should sleep at least one hour after feeding and again, we should not indicate no if it's due to something else like lab came in to drop the PKU or um, many visitors were passing the baby around and waking the baby up. Um, it should just be if it seems to be related to NAS. And consoling, so they should console within 10 minutes. That feels like a really long time to me, <laughs> to you, I'm sure. Um, so if they're even approaching 10 minutes and you feel like they're really inconsolable because of NAS, I think you could dock them a point because of that. And uh, do not indicate no if it seems to be due to other factors like they're exclusively breastfeeding and baby is just hungry and that's why they're inconsolable. Okay. So some consoling techniques, I'm sure you know all of this. Um, using your voice and speak softly and slowly, looking, facilitating that hand to mouth movement, using pacifiers if they need, um, a firm hand on the abdomen, I know you know all of these things. Um, pull the arms and legs into their body, swaddle, um, rocking and swaying, and just but you can teach parents to do all of these things. And um, a pacifier, a blood finger, or a feeding if it's feeding time. Okay, so the way our scoring system works, we, we set it up as high is good. The three is, the, you start out with the three and you lose points if you can't eat, sleep, console. That is the opposite of what the Grossman folks did. So, um, but hopefully it won't be confusing because at least we're consistent with our institution. Um, and so then we initiate a huddle. You would initiate a huddle if there's any, any drop essentially from, from a three to a two or definitely any score of, of one or zero. And so the huddle, oh sorry, there's our, um, protocol sheet that we use on pediatrics. I don't know, honestly, if you'll be using that here or not. Um, but it records how much non-pharmacologic care, how much family presence has been there, so. We're gonna go with, we, we held up the sense of Epic is coming in electronic form. We're not gonna use the paper form. We're just gonna separate right from that and go to yeah. the EMR. Yeah, on Keats, we had to create a paper form since there was nothing in the EMR. Okay, thank you. Um, so the huddle includes the family, your bedside nurse, the physician, or the provider for the baby. The provider, I'd say, doesn't have to be in-house, so if this is the middle of the night and you're calling either the hospitalist or the FP or whoever's on, they can participate by phone. Uh, but we really try to involve the family, too. And so the first goal of the huddle is what non-pharmacologic cares are we doing so far, and can we? is there something we can do to improve non-pharmacologic cares? So is there somebody else who can come in to leave the parents to hold the baby, or does, is the baby hungry and needs to supplement, and hopefully that would avoid morphine, um, ways to improve feeding, ways to improve non-pharmacologic care, and then lastly is a single dose trial of morphine indicated because we completely maxed out our non-pharmacologic cares. Uh, so the way we use morphine now is, um, uh, is single dose, start, essentially every baby starting with a single dose rather than committing them to Q3, um, and then reassess in three hours. So. Um, that obviously, that's not going to happen on FMC. If, if we decide that a baby needs a dose of morphine, if mom is discharging or dischargeable soon, then they can all go to pediatrics to start their morphine. Uh, if mom is still going to remain inpatient for the foreseeable future, then baby will go to NICU, and we do unfortunately have to separate them temporarily. And our, our goal is that we would give a single dose of morphine in the NICU and have them monitored for signs of respiratory depression for at least three hours, possibly six hours. 
Um, and if they only need that one dose, then they could potentially come back up to FMC. Um, if they do end up needing a second dose in NICU, then we would just admit there because we don't want to have too much back and forth. So, um, yeah, I'm trying to get the family involved with here. Okay. This would be our suggested dose range. And, and we do end up starting babies on Q3 dosing if a baby requires three or more single doses in 24 hours. Which will not be here, but that's something you can tell families to expect. Um, this is about weaning. So the babies that are on Q3 dosing on pediatrics, we've been weaning them um, quite frequently. So um, you, know, you can reassure families that even if the baby ends up on Q3 dosing, we consider them for weans multiple times daily, um, usually two times daily, sometimes up to three times daily. Um, so their length of stay is not going to be this weeks and weeks like it used to be uh, for the average baby. Okay. Um, we cre this is for pediatrics. We created a what to expect when your baby is in the pediatrics unit for NAS. I believe that there's going to be a form like this for FMC and NICU too. I think Val or somebody's working on that. Um, that will just be a handout and, and I mean hopefully it can even be given to families at their prenatal visits if we know that their baby's going to have to be observed for NAS. And these are our uh, results on pediatrics so far. So, um, 239 babies, lots of babies since 2017, including 130 that we treated since the Sleep Console launch um, about a year and a half ago. And so our percent treated with morphine used to be 60%, now it's down to 23%. And that's any amount of morphine, whether a single dose or Q3. Um, and that 20% is consistent with a lot of data that's coming out around the country. Um, Pretty much everybody is, who's doing Eat Sleep Console it ends up treating about 20% of babies with morphine, so it shouldn't be thought of as like a failure if a baby needs morphine. Um, it seems like this is just going to be the magic number where around one in five are, are just really going to need morphine no matter what you do. Um, our length of stay was already pretty good at 8.6 days, a lot better than other institutions, and now it's down to 5.4 days. Um, for NAS-related length of stay only, that excludes like if we have them on a CPS hold or something else afterwards. And the charges, of course, decreased by about a third or so. Um, and these are just graphs of the same. So we were at about 60% treated with morphine, now down to about 23%. There's the uh, average length of stay for NAS only. Sorry, I'm on call. Um, and the total length of stay, including other things like working on feeding or admin holds. And we think that because we're rolling this out in FMC and NICU now and catching all these babies before they even end up in NICU, that our length of stay and morphine uses is probably going to even go down from, from what we have here. So um, parent satisfaction, this is something that we really want to put in our study to um, track, but um, it's a really hard thing to track to survey people. So just anecdotally, though, I think the vast majority of parents um, and nurses have been really um, on board with this and it's been really popular um, because of the fact that they, we don't necessarily commit the baby to Q3 dosing and the length of stay is a lot shorter. Um, there's a smaller subset, I would say, of parents that are a little skeptical of it, um, and those are mainly the parents that either, like I said before, um, don't want their baby to have any withdrawal, and want their baby to complete, be completely pain-free, so those are the, the parents that we try to emphasize to them, like, we do expect some signs of withdrawal. Your baby is going to have high tone, tremors, um, maybe loose stools, that kind of thing, but if they can eat, sleep, console well, then they really don't need morphine. Um, and uh, yeah, and some of those parents, if they had an older child go through our old protocol and they're expecting this baby to have the same length of stay, they can be a little bit skeptical at the start, but um, uh, really involving them in the process has made it really popular with them, so. Okay. And um, as far as balancing measures, which shows are we doing the right thing, are we um, you know, treating these babies appropriately and not ignoring signs of withdrawal. For one thing, on pediatrics, we're still tracking Finnegan's along with ESC scores. That is going to go away, but just to reassure everybody, um, the babies that had high Finnegan's ended up having bad eat sleep console scores too, and they got morphine. Um, and the babies that did not get morphine had nice low Finnegan scores, so it is consistent. Um, we did have two readmissions, so out of that whole, what, 130 babies or so, only two were readmitted after going home, and neither was restarted on morphine afterwards. So we think we're doing the right thing for these babies, and the babies are not, you know, going home to fail or to suffer. Questions? Yes. Are we sending any kind of information out to the providers, the OBs and the midwives, so that they can get mm -hmm. information to the parents before delivery? That is the plan, yeah. I don't know if it's going to be discussed at the MSPT meeting, but I definitely ha I already have an email composed that's going to, an announcement that's going to go out to all the providers so they can prepare the their patients beforehand. Uh -huh. And I just wonder in your numbers, I mean, you look really good, but how many really were in FMC that never, that, that 
panel of things, or that really that we worked with the sleep and console already, not even knowing that it was the protocol, but we just kind of kept them without having to go downstairs. Yes, yes, there may have been even more. Yeah. Yes. Uh, most of them are tracked here because most ended up having to spend at least another day on PEDS after mom was discharged, but oh, right. I suppose there are some that maybe got their 48 to 72 hour ops. That first day where they start having symptoms, it, sometimes it's a lag of about 24 hours before you start mm -hmm. seeing it, so the feeding issues and stuff that we would have that first day might not even be present or even have the PEDS. So you might not even notice the, any feeding issues or, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good point that I didn't mention. You've, you've probably so noticed that's that... That's sleepy phase and that's the non-reactive phase. The non-reactive phase, right, right. The first 24 so hours, you'd be hard pressed. Maybe you would have to have pretty severe symptoms to get started on morphine in the yeah. first 24 hours, yeah. You probably all noticed with the, with the short-acting opiate-exposed babies like a heroin or oxycodone exposed, they tend to withdraw quickly and in the first 24 hours. And if you can just get them, we found if we can just give one or two doses of morphine and get them over that hump, then they don't necessarily need Q3 dosing for a long course. And similar with the methadone or the subutex exposed babies, their worst time tends to be in the 48 to 72 hour mark. And a lot of them can just get one or two doses of morphine and get over that hump and not necessarily need Q3. So, so we are hoping that there are some babies that um, end up going to NICU for one dose and potentially come back up to FMC. If, you end up, if they fail and have to go back again, then they're just gonna have to stay in NICU because we don't want too much back and forth. So you might see and see some babies that had a dose and then come back to you. Any other questions? Or what are the thoughts about this in general? Do you feel good about this or hesitant about it? I think it's, well, I think it's a great idea, but also it's going to affect the acuity of the nurses because we're going to have 35. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to be negative. We're going to have 35 liters, and we're going to have more mass babies in our units. Right. So our is going to be high. And you're going to be pushed to do more non-pharmacologic care. Yeah. And the preemies with NAS are complicated. Sometimes it's hard to tell. Like, are they are they failing because they're preemies or because of the NAS? And yeah, they're the ones more likely to get morphine because we're not sure. <laughs> What's going on? Okay. All right. Well, thank you all.